All right, so let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the third installation of Mayor Brown's 2022 Banking and Financial Services Litigation Webinar Series. Today's program will focus on cross-border themes and developments in anti-money laundering. My name is Gina Perlavecchio, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's New York office and a member of the Global Investigations and White Collar Defense Practices. Prior to joining Mayor Brown, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, where I served as the chief of the office's International Narcotics and Money Laundering Section. Joining me as co-presenters today are Suzanne Harris, a partner in the Litigation and Dispute Resolution Practice in our Hong Kong office, where she focuses on cross-border financial regulatory and compliance investigations. Stephen Moy, a partner and solicitor advocate in Mayor Brown's litigation and dispute resolution practice in London, where he, his practice focuses on finance-related investigations and disputes. Stephen previously spent two years at a global financial institution advising in relation to a financial crime and compliance investigation. And finally, Joydeep Sengupta, who is counsel in the compliance investigations and regulatory team of Mayor Brown's Paris office. Joydeep focuses on cross-border litigation, compliance, and enforcement matters for financial institutions and corporations. Now, before we begin, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Please note, when accessing Mayor Brown webinars via our WebEx platform, we suggest avoiding software such as Citrix to decrease disruption or quality loss. Secondly, today's program is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume's up so you can hear the presentation. This webinar is also being recorded. If you have any questions that are unanswered during the presentation, we invite you to submit questions using the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen. If there are any unanswered questions during the presentation, we'll do our best to follow up with you directly after the webinar is ended. Regarding CLE credit, we'll provide an alphanumeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Please return this form within 10 days of the event by either scanning or taking photos of the form and emailing copies to cleevents at mayorbrown.com or faxing the form to 1-312-701-7711. And with those matters concluded, let's get started. So today, Suzanne, Stephen, Joydeep, and I will focus on four recent anti-money laundering trends and developments that we've been watching in our respective jurisdictions. First, we'll talk about beneficial ownership reporting requirements that have evolved recently. Second, we'll discuss emerging sanctions and anti-money laundering trends, especially in the wake of the war in Ukraine. Next, we'll explore recent trends in the use of anti-money laundering tools to combat corruption. And finally, we'll talk about the state of cross-border cooperation and anti-money laundering investigations and enforcement. Next slide, please. To get us started, let's first look at beneficial ownership registration and reporting requirements that have developed in the U.S. over the past year and a half. At the beginning of 2021, the U.S. Congress passed a major piece of legislation, which included several anti-money laundering provisions, including something called the Corporate Transparency Act. The Corporate Transparency Act requires certain corporate entities, including limited liability companies, to register with a division of the U.S. Treasury Department known as the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or commonly known as FinCEN, and companies must disclose their ultimate natural person beneficial owners. Now, the Corporate Transparency Act is considered one of the most significant recent developments to U.S. anti-money laundering regime, which has historically had some of the lowest disclosure requirements in regard to beneficial ownership. And it was also particularly notable because it established a first of its kind beneficial ownership registry in the US. Now, the purpose of the beneficial ownership registry is to provide a single comprehensive source of beneficial ownership information to essentially prevent bad actors from forming opaque legal entities like shell companies, which as many of you may know is a common component of money laundering schemes um, to further their financial crimes. The data from the registry will be stored in a private database and will not be accessible publicly. The registry will be maintained by FinCEN, which also maintains um, the database of suspicious activity reports and is an important partner to US law enforcement agencies. The beneficial ownership registry requirement will apply to both US entities and foreign entities that are registered in the US 
including liability, limited liability companies. The entities must register with FinCEN and report to FinCEN all ultimate beneficial owners, which means all individuals with substantial control or 25% ownership interest, all company applicants, and the reporting company itself. Now, there are some pretty sweeping e exemptions um, to this to the registry requirement. There are 23 categories of exempt entities, and this generally includes entities that are in heavily regulated industries such as U.S. banks, SEC reporting issuers, broker dealers, and registered investment companies and advisors. So just a few notable exempted entities include uh, large operating companies, um, and that encompasses companies that employ more than 20 full-time employees, have more than $5 million in gross receipts or sales in the aggregate, and um, companies that have operating presence um, at a physical U.S. office. Um, the exemptions also encompass any subsidiaries owned or controlled by other exempt entities. Now, parties that fall under these reporting requirements will have a grace period before they must register, but failure to register will carry monetary penalties and possibly imprisonment. Um, but we're still awaiting rules to see, you know, how, how those penalties may apply. Now, the beneficial ownership registry will be an important resource for investigators who previously had to rely on costly and time consuming, time consuming investigative tools to obtain beneficial ownership information for closely held corporate entities. So we really expect that this registry is going to substantially uh, assist investigators in anti-money laundering um, investigations and prosecutions. But, you know, even just as important, it, the hope is that the registry will deter bad actors from using shell companies to shield their ill-gotten assets. And, um, you know, a just of note is that beneficial ownership reporting has taken on an even greater significance in the past several months with the U.S.'s efforts to seize the assets of Russian oligarchs, which are often held through various entities with murky ownership. Now, the beneficial ownership registry is part of a broader trend that we've seen under the Biden administration of encouraging greater transparency in financial transactions. And as a part of that trend, the Biden administration uh, is seeking to achieve greater transparency by also ramping up reporting requirements for real estate transactions. Um, you know, high value real estate has long been a favored vehicle to shield bad actors ill gotten gains not just in the US, but I know in other jurisdictions as well, and I expect um, my colleagues will talk about that today. Um, but in recognizing that fact, the US regulators are pursuing enhanced regulations to prevent bad actors from exploiting real estate uh, for money laundering purposes. And as a part of that trend, we've seen this year um, that FinCEN is poised to expand a reporting program that it had implemented back in 2016 that had previously been limited in scope geographically, geographically to a few cities like New York, Miami, and Los Angeles that were favored high-end real estate markets for money launderers. Uh, but recent statements by FinCEN this year indicate that it will seek to expand that reporting program nationally. It would mainly apply to either commercial or residential real estate transactions that are not financed, and any enhanced reporting requirements would apply to professionals in the real estate market, like title insurers, real estate developers, managers, lenders, and investment advisors and investment companies involved in real estate. Stephen, what are some of the recent developments in beneficial ownership reporting in the UK? Thanks, Gina. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so in the UK too, there have been recent changes to beneficial ownership reporting, um, and in particular in relation to real estate ownership as well. Um, as Gina just mentioned, uh, real estate does tend to be a popular vehicle for money laundering in the UK as well. But just to take um, a quick small step back first, uh, the new reporting requirements are due to a new law, uh, quite a broad new law that was introduced last month, and that's the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act. Um, this had actually been in the pipeline for three or four years now, but it was essentially rushed through, pushed through last month, um, given the events in, in Ukraine, and in particular to address the belief that the UK, and especially high-end real estate in and around London, is used uh, for money laundering by individuals and by entities which are believed to be linked to the Russian government. So, for example, in February, uh, Transparency International, the anti-corruption NGO reported that since 2016, 
that more than two billion dollars worth of UK real estate has been bought by Russian nationals who have been accused of financial crime or had links to the Russian government. And that's only Russia related suspicious wealth. The total figure for this period, according to TI, was actually around eight and a half billion. Uh, so the new law um, came into effect on 15th of March. Um, having said that, there is another economic crime bill expected later in the year. Um, so many of these properties um, are believed to be owned through, as Gina said, murky offshore companies, which are used to hide their beneficial ownership. And so one of the developments brought about by the new law, and I'll cover this shortly, is to establish a beneficial ownership register of overseas entities that own real estate in the UK. Um, but the Act also has provisions regarding UK sanctions enforcement and enhanced so-called unexplained wealth orders, which are aimed at combating corruption and serious crime. And both of these I'll talk about a bit later on. Can we have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, one of the purposes of the new law uh, is to increase transparency in the ownership of overseas entities that own UK property. And this is by introducing a new public register of those entities. Um, the new regime will affect all legal entities which are not incorporated in the UK. And this is both if they want to acquire property in the future or if they currently own UK property that was purchased since um, 1999 in England and Wales or for Scot Scottish land, December 2014. So the new requirements do actually also apply retrospectively. And so what are those requirements? Well, as set out in the third bullet on this slide, these entities have to take reasonable steps to identify and disclose details about all of their registrable beneficial owners. And that means individuals who have either more than 25% of the shares or votes, the right to appoint or remove a majority of the board, or who exert significant influence or control over the entity. Now, overseas entities that currently own UK land have six months to do this, so that's by September. And those that don't comply or who knowingly or recklessly make a false statement may face penalties. In particular, they won't be able to legally register the purchase or the sale of a property. And under English law, it's registration that determines legal title and ownership. And there are also criminal sanctions. Uh, that's daily fines of up to £2,500 and imprisonment of the officers of the entities of up to five years. The new register is going to be administered um, by the UK Companies Register. Uh, it's called Companies House. And the infrastructure is still being set up, so it'll be interesting to see in the coming months how it's implemented um, and then enforced. I think I'll now pass over to Joydeep to cover developments in France and the EU. Great. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Gina. Um, and I also want to have a quick shout out to I see a lot of names from Europe and it's late in the day here. So thank you for making time to join us at, uh, at the end of your work day. So we really appreciate it. Um, I'll talk um, uh, very briefly on some of the um, developments that we've seen here in Europe, starting with um, the EU directive from 2018, uh, which I note on the slide. Um, on the prevention and the use of the financial system for the purpose of money laundering and terrorist financing. So that has strengthened the existing uh, directive from 2015. It has been transposed into uh, French law. So it took some time to be transposed to international law um, and be adapted. So obviously France could impose higher standards than, than uh, what the EU provided. Um, and essentially uh, in the transposition uh, in Article 561.22 of the French Monetary and Financial Code, uh, it provides that the beneficial owner is a natural person who is the fi finally or lastly controls directly or indir indirectly the customer or for whom a transaction is carried out or, is, or an activity is being performed. Um, so that obviously raises a lot of questions. Who is what? Uh, who, is a, who is such a natural person who has control? Um, and what the legislator has done in France is said, um, similar to what you've seen in some of the other jurisdictions, is that either directly or indirectly owning 25% of the share capital or the voting rights of the reporting entity um, or company. So that's your, your threshold. 
Alternatively, it can also be a natural person who exercises by any other means a controlling interest in the company or entity within the meaning of um, an article in the French commercial code. So that, that's a de facto determination, whether it be through voting rights that he or she holds, uh, decisions in general meetings, uh, the power to appoint or dismiss the majority of members of the, the supervisory bodies, the administrative bodies. So you have to take a, a very holistic look as to who exercises control. So it's not a check the box exercise. Um, and and there's, it, the legislators also look at situations where the entity is not a commercial company. So in instances when it's, um, let's say, a collective investment, uh, an economic interest grouping, a trade union, um, or certain types of nonprofit organizations. Um, and there it's similar twofold determination. So either 25% of the capital of the, of the reporting entity of the share of uh, voting rights, um, or uh, having the power to appoint or dismiss majority of the members. And then the second prong is this ability to exercise by means of a power of control over the admin management executive committee of the supervisory bodies. So it's a similar type of test. And if there's no natural person um, that can be identified, then whoever is the legal representative. So it's well thought out in terms of kind of the, the, the potential people who have to report. Um, the one interesting piece, which is, I guess, similar to what Gina mentioned in the US, um, is what about non-listed, it, it's primarily seems to target non-listed companies. So there's an ex exception, obviously, for listed companies um, that are already supervised or, or large financial institutions that already have many reporting obligations. So, so they're kind of exempt from this. Um, maybe that we move to the next slide. Um, we talked briefly about the, the reporting requirements. Um, there, so France, as you know, in 2016 um, and 2017, implemented the Sapandu law, which is our big anti-corruption reform. And that brought a lot of innovations, including the creation of deferred prosecution agreements um, and adding obligations for entities to impose certain compliance requirements. And in addition, some filing obligations um, regarding beneficial ownership, um, as well as bringing, putting in place a whistleblowing system. So as you'll hear throughout this whole presentation, there's a lot of overlap on the anti-corruption and bribery side, on the sanction side, um, as well as on the AML side. Um, the, who has access to the registry? That's an interesting point. So obviously, there, there are different levels of access depending on what you use it for. So as a, as a member of the government or regulatory authority, you would have a higher level of access than if you're simply researching uh, for KYC purposes. There are obviously some penalties. Um, in my opinion, they're not sufficiently uh, uh, sufficiently deterrent. As you can see, it's you know 7,500 euros for natural persons and uh, 37,500 penalty for um, for the legal persons, but the admin penalties can be quite significant as well. So you could face dissolution, um, other administrative and civil penalties. One of the other things we wanted to mention is a lot of EU-wide uh, efforts to consolidate, share information, coordinate. Um, and so here you see the creation of Boris recently. Um, it's an EU level connected database that includes the European economic area. So it picks up Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, um, and we'll talk later about the creation of the new EU uh, AML authority. Next slide, please. So I won't go into all of these. We just want to mention briefly some of the kind of recent enforcement decisions in France from the banking regulator, which picks up AML deficiencies. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of big names here. So, you know, foreign banks, French banks, um, the, the penalties range from, you know, 700,000 euros to you see 50 million euros um, from the Banque Postale. And the main um, deficiencies that led to these penalties, um, it's kind of unfortunate because it's sort of the same recurring theme each time. Um, and a lot of times it's the failure to uh, file a suspicious transaction report. Um, it's the risk assessment uh, system not being sufficiently detailed or uh, insufficient filtering um, or not running names of potential clients through the European asset freeze or the French um, gel d'avoir asset freezing uh, databases. So sort of recurring um, patterns, there's very little intentional behavior, I would say. Um, for the most part, you see a lot of inappropriate supervision. 
um, the internal controls being deemed to be not sufficiently strong. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Suzanne for Hong Kong. Thanks, Joy D. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, now I'd just like to, to move across the globe to Hong Kong and just give a bit of context first regarding um, AML um, efforts in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong and mainland China are both members of FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, um, that monitors countries to ensure they implement the FATF standards and holds countries to account that don't comply. Hong Kong used to be on FATF's radar um, in prior reports um, that FATF produced, but um, managed to turn this around in the most recent review that took place um, in 2019, um, when FATF um, gave Hong Kong a satisfactory level of compliance rating in, in all areas. Um, Hong Kong as a global financial centre is obviously keen to keep this rating going forward. The Hong Kong AML legislative framework is made up of a number of statutes, um, including the uh, Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorist Finance or Ordinance, or AMLO, um, this applies to licensed corporations, um, including financial institutions, and imposes CDD and record keeping requirements. So in summary, a financial institution will commit an offence if it knowingly fails uh, to take reasonable measures to ensure proper safeguards exist uh, to prevent non-compliance or mitigate money laundering risk. One of obviously the key CDD requirements under AMLO includes the identification and verification of um, beneficial owners. And in 2018, there are a couple of um, key changes to beneficial ownership requirements in Hong Kong. Um, and again, it's something quite familiar to what's already been covered um, in, in the other countries that we've been speaking about today. So first of all, uh, the company's ordinance was amended um, to provide that every company incorporated in Hong Kong um, except for listed companies, obtain and maintain up-to-date beneficial ownership information through a significant controller's register. And AMLO also was amended um, to change the threshold at which beneficial ownership is defined from not less than 10% to more than 25% um, to align with prevailing international standards and practices, which again is consistent with what we've been hearing today. Beneficial ownership remains a focus area for both FATF and Hong Kong regulators. Last month, the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, the SFC, published a circular to licensed corporations on FATF's amendments to Recommendation 24, which is about transparency and beneficial ownership of legal persons. It's expected that FATF members follow a multi-pronged approach to ensure that competent authorities are able to access adequate, accurate, and up-to-date beneficial ownership information and assess and address risks posed by uh, both domestic and foreign created um, persons which have sufficient links with their country. So all very consistent um, themes that we've been talking about that is, uh, everyone's trying to address across the globe. And this slide is just to really give you a snapshot of some of the regulatory enforcement in Hong Kong on AML. Um, it's not fully comprehensive, but it does give you a sense as to um, the action that has been taken by the two main regulators in Hong Kong. Um, that is the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the HKMA and the SFC. The HKMA actions are highlighted in orange and the SFC actions are in blue. You can see that the majority of the enforcement has been by the SFC, although a recent run of HKMA actions since uh, last quarter of 2021, including four actions that were announced in November, may indicate a sign of things to come. Um, the ones that are highlighted in yellow are money laundering enforcement actions that identified beneficial ownership compliance control failings. All of those are part of overall findings of multiple AML compliance and control failures of which beneficial ownership features. And these kinds of issues are similar to what Joy Deep was describing actually in terms of some of the actions that have taken place in France as well. So um, issues around name screening of beneficial owners, um, not identifying the source of wealth and um, source of funds of politically exposed persons or their beneficial owners before establishing or continuing the business relationship with those customers. 
In light of the uh, developments of beneficial ownership requirements by FATF, as well as in the US, UK and France, I'm sure it will continue to be an area of focus for regulators in Hong Kong and the region. Another focus area that is particularly topical given current world events is, is sanctions. Gina, perhaps you can kick us off with the recent developments in the US and how these efforts align with those to stamp out money laundering. Sure. So um, some of the most notable developments in sanctions and money laundering in the US this year relate to the US's reaction to the war in Ukraine. So in connection with the war, the US has instituted sanctions against uh, Russian financial institutions and high net worth individuals, um, primarily through executive orders in the US Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or more commonly known as OFAC. Um, and just to give you an example, just this month, um, President Biden issued a new executive order, the latest of several executive orders that have, that have come out since February, uh, which bans new investment in the Russian Federation. And since February 2022, um, OFAC announced significant new sanctions on key Russian financial institutions, state-owned enterprises, high net worth individuals, and other key Russian interests that are substantially integrated in the global economy. Um, most notably, as I'm sure many of the attendees um, in this audience are aware, um, this included cutting off Russia's largest financial institution, Sparebank, from the U.S. financial, inst financial system um, through prohibitions on financial institution correspondent banking and payable through account relationships with Sparebank and 25 of its subsidiaries. Um, and this uh, uh, sanctions against Russian financial institutions also um, extended to comprehensive sanctions against Russia's second largest financial institution, VTB. And this is, of course, all in addition to the various expert prohibitions that the U.S. has imposed, um, which is really um, force U.S. companies and financial institutions to take a hard look at um, any sort of export activity and screening it for potential anti-money laundering and, and violations of um, various export uh, statutes in the U.S. Now, uh, while enforcement of economic sanctions are typically handled in the civil context through the Treasury Department in the U.S., um, in the instance of sanctions imposed in connection with the war in Ukraine, the U.S. Department of Justice has taken a notably active role. It recently established um, the, a task force called Task Force Klepto Capture, which in ad addition to having a great name, um, is an interagency law enforcement task force which is focused on enforcing sanctions, export restrictions, and economic countermeasures that the U.S. has imposed along with its allies and, and partners in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, notably, the task force is led by um, Andrew Adams, who used to co-lead the Transnational Organized Crime and Money Laundering Unit of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. So he's really approaching this initiative with a deep understanding of anti-money laundering issues and how it intersects with broader transnational um, issues and, and crime. Now, the task force will target um, crimes by Russian officials, government-aligned elites, and those who aid or conceal um, any of their unlawful conduct. And the task force will look to combat efforts to undermine sanctions against Russian financial institutions, like the kind that I just mentioned, um, including prosecution of actors attempting to evade know your customer um, regulations and other anti-money laundering measures. Now, some of the other AML issues the task force will examine include trade-based money laundering and failures of anti-money laundering in both traditional and new payment systems. And, and putting an emphasis on new payment systems, um, you know, for example, the task force will target efforts to use cryptocurrency to evade U.S. sanctions or launder proceeds of foreign corruption. Um, now, I recently attended a speech given by Mr. Adams about this new task force, and one of the comments he made is that um, that's really most pertinent to our discussion today is the fact that the alignment of priorities between the U.S. and its international partners on the sanctions front is really unprecedented, and that's led to increased cross-border coordination between the U.S. and its allies, um, including freezing assets in jurisdictions where such seizures really would not have been possible before. And I anticipate that coordination and um, cross-border cooperation will also extend to anti-money laundering and sanctions enforcement. Now, Joydeep, I know the U.S. and France have been aligned in imposing sanctions against Russian interests and in reaction to the war in Ukraine. Can you tell us more about the steps that France has taken? Sure. Thank you, Gina. 
um, our favorite topic. I'm sure many, many of the people listening today um, are dealing with this on a daily basis. So um, obviously since the Russian sanctions um, were imposed, or the waves of sanctions started getting in, imposed earlier this year, um, the enforcement landscape has completely changed in Europe. So um, the dirty little secret, which is not really a secret, is that you know most of the enforcement on the sanction space was being done by the US. So most major financial institutions in Europe know OFAC intimately and increasingly off sea in the UK. But really, you know, like who enforces sanctions in Europe? Who does what? You know, it's usually sort of there's 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 this ignorance, which is because there's no enforcement essentially. But all that is changing in a, in a way that we've never seen before. Um, and and both words and actions. Um, the one big um, reason is, you know, if you, if you recall over, you know, and our firm has been quite involved in a lot of the big sanctions investigations over the past few years that have touched, that always have cross-border components. All of our colleagues today, we've all worked on these investigations uh, touching our big global financial centers, Hong Kong, New York, London, Paris. Um, but within Europe and each of our financial centers are also tied to other centers uh, where money flows across the world. Um, so if you look at, you know, the Pandora Papers, um, the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, Russian Laundromat, Swiss Leaks, there's links with pretty much all of our jurisdictions. And in addition, the centers of private banking. Um, so if you look at Monaco, Luxembourg, Dubai, um, you know, Singapore, those are places that often that's where money tied to Russia and other sanctioned countries flows through. Um, and the regulators obviously know that. Um, and now all of the tools that are being put in place, which we talked about earlier in terms of information sharing, coordinated supervision, um, reporting obligations, uh, all of that is bringing to bear this, you know, what looks like a whole infrastructure enforcement that we've never seen before. Um, so for the most part, you know, my experience is really in the in the financial services sector in Europe, and we're seeing both from the corporate investment banking sector as well as the private banking sector that people are trying to figure out what the links to the their jurisdiction are. Um, obviously, there are certain exceptions, there are licenses that are being coordinated um, with the EU, Europe, or, sorry, EU, US, UK, and other jurisdictions. Um, but because the enforcement landscape has really not been very strong. Um, some entities are taking more measured risks. So one notable example, for instance, you'd see the wave of companies that have divested from Russia, um, which has not been the case for France. So France is the biggest, single biggest foreign employer in Russia, over 160,000 employees. Um, but many of our largest companies are still operating in France, more in a way to kind of within a closed ecosystem. So instead of allowing financial flows outside of the country, um, and one of the reasons for that is, is the concern of, of imposition of um, Russian retaliatory measures, including expropriation. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. The second big piece that um, I want to mention is this focus of, on intermediaries. And Europe, as you know, is a center of private banking. Um, and we have um, some of the most fancy assets of the oligarchs, you know, yachts in, in the Côte d'Azur. Uh, you know, fancy mansions in London that Stephen mentioned, um, fancy watches in Geneva, art collections all over Europe. So all of those assets are difficult to trace. Um, there's no beneficial ownership registry of art, for instance. So it's a very attractive asset class if someone's trying to, um, you know, hide from um, from their assets being seized. And so there's increased scrutiny in those areas. Um, why, why is this? We are seeing the, 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 the regulators are trying to focus on the intermediaries who are involved. Um, so if you're a jewelry consultant and you're buying diamonds for the oligarch's friends and transporting them across borders, that is a high risk activity now, right? Because, because that's under the radar. Um, there's also another issue which we're finding a lot of our financial institutions clients are struggling in Europe. And that's the issue of what is contournement or circumvention in EU law of sanctions. So if your client says, hey, um, I may be you know, subject to sanctions, I can't do this transaction in rubles or, or uh, sorry, in dollars or euro, uh, but you, will you help me buy an alternative asset with the funds that I already have in your jurisdiction? Or you know, transfer of assets via 
uh, creation of new entities and offshore uh, jurisdictions where the ultimate beneficial owner is difficult to trace. So those kinds of issues are gray areas. Um, the U.S. has a whole line of jurisprudence as well as guidance from OFAC on what constitutes facilitation payments. Um, and typically, it's a little bit easier um, because most of the U.S. regs on sanctions provide guidance on approving, facilitating um, financial transactions, which in Europe, it, you know, there's no similar type of jurisprudence simply because there have been so little enforcement. So we're looking often the way we're advising our clients in Europe now is looking at what's been done in, in the US and then transposing that here. The, the final piece I want to mention is, is what um, Gina, um, Stephen and, and Suzanne all, also mentioned is these asset freezing mechanisms and that are being strengthened. So France, uh, as part of the G7 cooperation has also um, various mechanisms for um, asset recovery. So there are two agencies, we have PIAC, which is a platform for identification of criminal assets. We have unpronounceable acronym AGRASAC. It's an agency for management and recovery of seized and confiscated assets. Um, and there's a lot of government resources that are being dedicated now to those agencies as they're going after and seizing high value assets across, across France. Um, there's also a banking centralized register called FICOBA, um, which is managed by the tax administration that can be used to trace, trace assets. There's national asset database, real estate uh, registries. So there's a lot of tools um, that are already existing that are now being shared, strengthened, resourced. Um, and so if you are a bank and, and you're facing this type of risk, um, it's not the same as before uh, this whole wave of enforcement measures. So the risk has definitely gone up. Um, and what we've also found is the French um, Treasury um, has been very helpful. So they've put out guidance, they've offered a um, kind of a similar mechanism as you have for off and OFAC in terms of getting answers for questions, licensing, um, which people typically didn't tend to do very much in Europe. Uh, OFAC has a you know, very developed licensing system. So those are some of the things we're seeing in, in France. So with that, I'll pass it on to, um, to, uh, to London. Thanks, Joy Deep. It's it's apt that I follow Gina on the US position and, and, and you, Joy Deep, on the EU and French position, because since the UK's withdrawal from the EU, um, the UK government has tried to establish a distinct sanctions regime, a so-called third way. Um, so although EU sanctions were initially transposed directly into UK law, there started to be some, what's the phrase, um, policy drift between those two regimes, and there's still a lot of close coordination, and that's especially uh, for the recent sanctions against Russia. And as Gina observed earlier, the coordination has really, um, really has been unprecedented. Um, in terms of recent developments under the new Economic Crime Act, which I mentioned earlier, sanctions breaches are now a matter of strict liability, uh, in that the RFSI, the body which enforces UK sanctions, no longer has to prove that the person breaching sanctions knew or reasonably suspected that they were in fact breaching sanctions. Also in the past month or so, um, and possibly echoing the US klepto capture uh, task force, which Gina mentioned earlier, but perhaps slightly less dramatically named and without, without a cool name, um, the UK regulator has written to registered crypto firms um, regarding crypto assets being used um, as a tool to circumvent sanctions um, and essentially reminding them of their sort of their duties to sort of do their bit or, um, as regards sanctions against Russia. Um, this is not least because the trading of crypto assets against the ruble has apparently more than doubled since the invasion. Um, and finally, since the start of 2020 in the UK, I would just note that firms carrying on certain crypto asset activities have been subject or are subject to the UK uh, money laundering regime in that they're required to register with the regulator and also to have the usual systems and controls to manage financial crime risks, such as appropriate KYC and uh, D CDDA requirements. I think that leaves you, Suzanne, to cover similar developments in Hong Kong and China. Stephen, yeah, and just to pick up on the last point that you mentioned about um, um, new requirements in terms of crypto, similar things um, we see happening in, in Hong Kong. So in January of this year, the 
HKMA issued guidance to banks regarding their approach to virtual assets and vir virtual asset service providers or VASPs, another acronym to throw in the mix. Um, the circular states that banks should critically evaluate their exposures to different types of risks and put in place appropriate risk mitigation measures, including to pay extra attention when they're um, when they become aware of customers engaging in virtual um, asset, um, um, yeah, in virtual asset related activities um, and providing services to VASPs, which include assessing AML controls and risks. And there's two points that I just wanted to mention um, from a Hong Kong perspective in terms of sanctions. I think the first one is to note that Hong Kong does not implement unilateral sanctions. Um, its laws are designed to implement sanctions issued by the United Nations Security Council. So while there are no UN sanctions against Russia, um, for all the reasons that have just been covered by um, Gina, Stephen and Joy Deep, um, those doing business in Hong Kong are particularly conscious of um, requirements and sanctions that apply elsewhere um, and thinking about in particular secondary sanctions risks in Hong Kong. The other major development in the region has been the creation of a form of blocking statute in mainland China um, by way of the anti-foreign sanctions law that was enacted there in June of last year. It's broadly drafted and can apply to any unilateral sanctions that China determines constitute serious violations of its sovereignty and interests. It provides for countermeasures against individuals or organisations that have been uh, directly or indirectly involved in the formulation, adoption and implementation of what they call discretionary restrictive measures against Chinese citizens and organisations. And it also provides a private right of action for aggrieved parties to sue for losses incurred as a result of covered foreign sanctions. The extent of how this law is interpreted and applied remains to be seen, including whether a similar law will be passed in Hong Kong. Um, some may be aware that last year the National People's Congress Standing Committee was expected to pass a resolution to add uh, the mainland's anti-foreign sanctions law to Hong Kong's basic law, um, but the vote was then subsequently postponed. So let's now switch gears and move on to our third topic, which is about anti-corruption. Gina, can you tell us about how money laundering laws are being used in the US in this context? Sure. Um, so, it, you know, a trend we're seeing across jurisdictions is that anti-money laundering enforcement is playing a large part in combating corruption. Um, and even just going back over the last several years, the, the DOJ in the US um, has used money laundering prosecutions as a method to prosecute corruption related conduct when a foreign official or other actor cannot be directly charged under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or FCPA or under other US anti-bribery statutes. And DOJ has used this strategy against a broad array of, of actors, including foreign officials, their family members, bank executives, and even the financial institutions themselves. Um, this has been an attractive tool to the DOJ because money laundering laws allow DOJ to, to prosecute foreign government officials who allegedly receive bribe payments, um, even when DOJ can't satisfy the FCPA specific jurisdictional or evidentiary hurdles. Now, over just the last several months, the Biden administration has shown that it's poised to expand the strategy through a number of different ways. Um, and this was demonstrated by uh, a, an announcement it made in December of 2021 called the US Strategy on Countering Corruption. Now, this anti-corruption strategy emphasizes two key enforcement priorities, um, anti-corruption and anti-money laundering. And more specifically, it really detailed how the US intends to use anti-money laundering tools as a mean to, means to combat corruption. Now, this follow the money strategy um, it, the US seeks to implement, it will root out corruption through improving transparency in regard to beneficial ownership and real estate transactions, which we spoke about earlier, increasing um, obligations of gatekeepers to the financial system and strengthening collaboration and granting new powers to law enforcement that will basically act as a force multiplier for anti-money laundering enforcement efforts in the US and abroad. Um, now, of course, these steps are cause for concern for financial institutions and other corporations operating on a global scale because it creates secondary, li secondary liability um, for those who may unwittingly be doing business with kleptocrats or actors who are paying bribes. Um, now, 
you know, we've already talked about uh, the measures the U.S. is taking to improve financial transparency, um, but the administration is also seeking to increase reporting obligations of a broad array of gatekeepers to the financial system, such as lawyers, accountants, and trust and company service providers. Um, so those referring back to those individuals that uh, Joy Deep had described who may have clients coming to them saying, you know, I want to try to do uh, make certain financial transactions in a certain way to avoid um, avoid sanctions or other um, anti money laundering measures. Now, this imposition of additional reporting requirements on gatekeepers is significant because historically law enforcement in the US has had difficulty holding gatekeepers accountable for facilitating transactions that mask illicit funds because US regulations really did not require gatekeepers to have an understanding of the nature and source of their clients funds. And the White House's strategy really seeks to change that. One notable example that the strategy pointed out um, is that it indicated that the Treasury Department will re-examine anti-money laundering requirements for investment advisors, such as hedge funds and private equity funds. Now, another method that the US will harness in empowering um, DOJ and the Treasury Department um, to root out corruption is to seek forfeiture and recovery of funds traceable to foreign government corruption um, that are held at fi US financial institutions and found in the US or in the possession of US persons. So that will be accomplished through a new whistleblower program called the Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Rewards Program, um, which provides rewards of up to $5 million for information leading to the restraint or seizure of assets tied to foreign government corruption. Um, and recent announcements from the Treasury Department about this program points out another a, a number of different um, areas for um, focus, but among among these is um, it, it specifically identifies assets tied to the Russian Federation as a target for seizure. Um, now, just to get a sense of how important this strategy is to the Department of Justice, um, I recently attended a speech by the head of the DOJ's criminal division, Lisa Monaco, and she indicated that essentially, you know, know your customer measures and sanctions are the new FCPA from the point of view of corporate compliance and really said that multinational corporations will have to think hard about how these various sanctions regimes and um, anti-money laundering regimes will affect their business going forward. Stephen, what are some of the ways in which the UK is harnessing anti-money laundering regimes to combat corruption? Well, it, you mentioned the, the US approach of following the money um, and probably also because of the general inherent evidential difficulties you referred to in respect of corruption. In the past few years, the UK authorities have also looked at unexplained or suspicious wealth as a way of countering corruption. Um, I understand this is also a recent development in France, and without giving too much away, um, Joy Deep will cover that in a minute. Um, the new Economic Crime Act, which I've mentioned a couple of times, now looks to broaden and enhance enforcement in this area. Um, since February 2018, UK enforcement agencies have been able to make court applications for what's called an unexplained wealth order. Now, these target individuals whose assets appear to be disproportionate to their income. Um, there, there is a minimum threshold of £50,000, which is about $65,000. Um, these orders can be issued against PEPs or against those reasonably suspected of, of involvement in or of simply being connected to a person involved in serious crime. Uh, the legal test uh, is set out roughly in the middle of this slide um, is that there must be reasonable grounds uh, for suspecting that the respondents lawfully obtained income uh, would be insufficient for them to have acquired the assets in question or for suspecting that the property was acquired lawfully, unlawfully, sorry. Um, now, this isn't on the slide, but the most famous case so far in the UK has been the very first uh, unexplained wealth order against a Mrs. Hajieva. Uh, she was the wife of the former chairman of a state-owned bank in Azerbaijan. She owned a 15 million pound home in, the, in central London, um, just opposite Harrods. Uh, she also owned a golf course in Berkshire, just outside London, a private jet, and was also reported to have spent 16 million pounds in Harrods uh, over the road from her house across a 10 year period. Uh, so a respondent to an order like Mrs. Hajiva um, would just be required to explain their interest in the assets in question, 
uh, how much of it they own and how they came to own it. Now, if they refuse or they don't comply, the courts can just presume that the asset was in fact basically um, an ill-gotten gain or the proceeds of crime. The court can freeze the asset, uh, which could then later be forfeited, confiscated and seized. Um, but the record for these orders, which you can see here, has not really met expectations. So far, there have only been nine in four years, and actually only one has led to actual substantial assets so far being seized. Um, so this is what the new Act um, seeks to improve. These orders can now be issued against company directors and officers of respondents and trustees, and that's regardless of whether or not they're in the UK. Property held on trust for a respondent can now be included. Um, and in addition, enforcement agencies with the limited resources now have much longer as 186 days rather than 60 days uh, to review the information that's provided. But I think most importantly in practice, enforcement agencies, even if their application is unsuccessful, now they generally won't have to pay the legal costs of a respondent in any circumstances unless they acted unreasonably, dishonestly or improperly. I say this is important because it's believed that this is actually the key reason why there haven't been more of these orders uh, in the last four years. Uh, generally in UK litigation, if you lose, you're ordered to pay the other side's costs. Uh, in one application, the National Crime Agency was ordered to pay around one and a half million pounds in costs to a respondent who had successfully challenged an order. Uh, and this was said to have had a chilling effect on enforcement authorities, especially given they have such limited budgets. Uh, Joy Deep, I'll pass over to you to talk about AML on anti-corruption in France. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and so in France, you know, more than AML, I think the big revolution in, in our jurisdiction has been the Sapin d'Eau law. Um, which came into force um, in 2017 um, as a result of a, a, you know, some of the push came from a report at the OECD criticizing uh, the lack of enforcement, the lack of preventive measures um, in France. Um, and that was part of the OECD work group on bribery, which the US DOJ plays a big role in and advised on. As a result of this law, since uh, the Sapando has come into play, we have a lot of preventive measures in the jurisdiction. So that includes a code of conduct, um, internal whistleblowing processes. So the, the initial whistleblowing law came into place as a result of the Sapando law, um, risk mapping exercise on corruption um, based on your global footprint, uh, due diligence requirements for major clients, suppliers, intermediaries, internal and external control procedures, accounting uh, standards, training, obviously, tone of the top. So the full range of things that you normally would see from the DOJ guidance, um, compliance guidance, um, is, is actually part of this whole package of, of preventive measures that are imposed on French companies that hit a certain threshold of employees or um, turnover. Um, and what has happened as a result of this, what I would really call a revolution in France, is that all of a sudden you have a giant compliance industry that has that has developed, um, not which is for, for the most part it's been really great, because the expertise didn't used to exist in the country um, for these types of uh, compliance measures, um, and now they're homegrown. For the, so when this law was initially put in place, um, it's so surprising that you know large French companies had not heard preventive measures like why do I need to do internal audits for on my third party suppliers? So these were sort of new concepts in, in a way which today is no longer the case. And as a result of these very, very, you know, um, well-developed uh, preventive measures, um, there is a direct impact on AML uh, monitoring um, and prevention. So as a result, you can no longer kind of turn a blind eye and say, look, I, you know, some of the examples that Stephen gave, oh, my client is, I'm a bank and my client who earns 50,000 euros as a public official in Equatorial Guinea uh, owns a $30 million mansion on Avenue Foch uh, in Paris. So explain this bizarre you know, wealth. Um, so France has um, had uh, several very high profile and very you know, dramatic, if you like, you know, kind of glamorous uh, facts. This, this is, has everything, you know, Playboys, Instagram accounts, 
um, you know, lots of fancy Italian cars being seized by French authorities, mansions being raided. So it has all of these features, uh, so ill-gotten gains, um, where you have essentially if your assets are seized unless you can prove the lawful origin of the funds. And a high profile case is the OBN case of the vice president of Equatorial Guinea. Um, we also um, have seen more recently uh, strengthening of whistleblower protection laws in France, which will have an impact on AML. So these happened quite recently as a result of a lot of negotiating and back and forth um, in Parliament. Um, it's reshaping the definition of the whistleblower, um, so broaden it, broadening it um, beyond purely employees. Um, an extension, which is quite innovative, the extension of and protection of, of to the whistleblower's entourage. So, essentially, so imagine someone is scared of retaliation or potential, um, you know, physical harm. Um, can they go to a third party like Transparency International or some other type of nonprofit that is helping um, helping uh, them prevent? Um, so I realize there's there's not a ton of time left, so I don't want to go into much more detail. But those have been strengthened. And one other piece, which perhaps my colleagues will also touch on, is the next wave of reforms that we're seeing are actually on the other direction. So uh, there's a lot of protective measures. So initially, there was a lot of you know sharing of information through mutual legal uh, mutual legal assistance treaties, which now a lot of the reforms that have been proposed in France, including what will be set on three, will include a lot more protection for French companies before their the information um, and evidence is transferred abroad. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Suzanne for Hong Kong. I'm just going to go back now um, to cover the position in terms of um, Hong Kong and to pick up on something that Joy Deep just mentioned, um, because there are also, again, like the other jurisdictions we've been talking about today, amendments to Hong Kong Stock Exchange's Corporate Governance Code, um, which came into effect at the beginning of this year, requiring Hong Kong listed companies uh, to establish whistleblower and anti-corruption policies and systems. And this is part of a raft of new measures to make board level oversight of ESG issues a requirement for good corporate governance in Hong Kong. Um, I've mentioned here a couple of quotes from the FATF report in 2019, because even though um, Hong Kong was given um, the rating and, and, and clearance in terms of its compliance across all areas, it did flag that there were still deficiencies in transparency of legal arrangements. Um, and I think that really goes to some of the points we've been talking about and, and the challenges that um, we're facing across the globe in terms of issues around beneficial ownership in particular. There have been some significant global uh, corruption cases with substantive links to corruption and money laundering in Asia. And this has resulted in enforcement action being taken in the US and regulatory enforcement proceedings, for example, in Hong Kong, including significant fines um, imposed on the financial institutions that have been involved. Sensitivities in the region about bring, being ground zero of significant co global corruption scandals um, and a desire to ensure compliance and controls are effective at, ident at identifying these risks is really what's driving um, some of the focus for um, Hong Kong and other regulators um, in, in this part of the world. So this segues um, into our last topic, um, which is about cross-border cooperation, which is obviously a vital to address money laundering activities. Um, it also highlights the challenges in the current geopolitical environment. So Hong Kong has been committed to observing the international obligations on AML and has been playing a role um, in FATF and the Asia Pacific Group on money laundering. Hong Kong also has laws in place governing mutual legal assistance in criminal matters in Hong Kong. However, following the enactment of the Hong Kong national security law in 2020, a number of jurisdictions, including the US and the UK, suspended the surrender of fugitive agreements with Hong Kong to avoid obligations to return individuals prosecuted under the new national security law. In response, the Hong Kong government suspended the mutual legal assistance arrangements with those jurisdictions. This is a practical example of the impact of geopolitical tensions on cooperation that we see. The extent to which it will impact cross-border cooperation of money laundering matters is 
still to be seen, but it highlights the potential challenge to navigate these issues and also meet international standards and expectations um, of cooperation. And on that note, I'll pass over to Gina to cover the position regarding US developments on cross-border cooperation. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, so recent efforts in the US, recent legislation and um, various other efforts are have been designed to increase cross-border cross coordination with other um, allies and, and partners across the world. Um, and just in 2021, the Anti-Money Laundering Act, which was passed as part of that massive legislation that I referenced earlier in the presentation, um, established, um, uh, in addition to establishing the Beneficial Ownership Registry, provided for sharing suspicious activity reports with foreign partners, which is a really um, important development in the in the area of cross-border coordination. It also um, looks to deploy Treasury Department attaches and FinCEN officials to help strengthen anti-money laundering legal frameworks and regimes across the world. Um, but one of the most important um, aspects of this legislation that increases cross-border coordination and, and really establishes the U.S. enforcement footprint in the area of anti-money laundering enforcement is um, the Federal prosecutors new subpoena power under um, section 6308 of the NDAA. Um, this new subpoena power allows uh, federal prosecutors to reach records relating to course, a correspondent banking account or any account at a foreign bank that has a correspondent account located in the US. And it allows um, federal prosecutors to reach any account maintained outside of the US through the subpoena power. Um, the subpoenas can be issued in connection with an investigation of a violation of U.S. criminal law, a civil forfeiture action, um, violations of the Bank Secrecy Act, or any investigation under Title 31 um, of the U.S. Code 5318A. Um, now, a non-U.S. bank serves as a subpoena may petition a U.S. federal court to quash or modify the subpoena. But a conflict with a foreign secrecy or confidentiality law is not sufficient grounds alone. There has to be a more substantial showing than just the fact that those particular blocking statutes or confidentiality statutes exist. And I know we're over time, so I'll pass it along to uh, Stephen. Thanks, Gina. Yeah, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll make this brief. Um, in the UK, the main changes, developments, new challenges uh, in relation to cross-border cooperation for many things, including AML, uh, arise from Brexit. Um, first and fundamentally, I suppose, uh, UK is no longer bound to implement AML directives or any directives issued by the EU, um, though it is expected that the two regimes will remain broadly aligned. Um, both sides have committed to take into account FATF, uh, recommendations. They've reached agreement in specific areas, for example, on transparency or beneficial ownerships. Um, second, the UK and the EU have also agreed in principle uh, to continue cooperating and sharing information on AML matters, though precisely how they're going to do that in practice for enforcement purposes uh, remains to be seen. Uh, I suppose it's still relatively early days. Um, and thirdly, one area where there hasn't been any specific agreement and which may affect enforcement is that the UK no longer has access to the main UK, uh, EU database, the live database on criminal suspects. Um, and some believe that this uh, will have the effect of slowing down the cross border uh, sharing of information, at least as between the UK and EU authorities. And finally, from a regulatory perspective, I just note that the FCA does have a number of agreements, memoranda of understanding. Uh, is what they're called, with certain overseas regulators, including many across Europe. Um, these are not, or they may not be legally binding, but they do provide a framework for cooperation, information sharing, and mutual assistance in respect of uh, financial crime issues. Joy Deep. Thanks very much, and, and thanks to all our very patient uh, participants for staying uh, over time. Thank you, we appreciate it. Um, I'll be very brief on this one. Um, in terms of the, the main cooperation measure that, that are very significant for our, especially of interest to our European clients, um, is a series of legislative measures, um, that, uh, which kind of a package of legal uh, and regulatory measures that were published um, by the EC, European Commission, in July of 2021. And one of the big pieces of that was the creation of an EU AML authority. Um, so what are some of these you know, why was this created? I mean, the European Banking uh, Authority, which is in Paris, uh, 
as for several years, has been identifying gaps in information sharing, gaps in supervision. Um, another you know, issue, obviously, the quality of the supervision is not the same across jurisdictions. Maybe resources are more limited. Uh, the country may not have sufficient you know, experts. Um, so the idea behind creation of uh, an EU-wide authority is, is brilliant, uh, partly because all of the typologies of AML are cross-border for the most part, all the complex typologies. Um, so what this does, it creates a single integrated AML supervision across the EU or with common supervisory standards. It supports coordination among EU FIUs. Um, in France, it's the type fin. Um, so they can share information, um, support coordination and co coordinate supervisors of non-financial entities, um, directly supervise the riskiest financial institutions. So this is big. So if, if you have a highly, high, you know, we've had a lot of scandals in Europe, you've had Wirecard and and other big scandals that have, have had a huge impact on our financial system. And so this would allow the authority to step in when the national you know, competent authority of the banking regulator uh, is not up to the task. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism of Baffin in particular in Germany of, of really kind of dropping the ball on, on that one. Um, there's also you know, support and cooperation. Uh, and often it's, it's a matter of sharing resources. You're not redoing the same things uh, with limited resources. Uh, and monitoring and coordinating the national supervisors responsible for other financial entities. So this is a big change in Europe. Um, we'll see how it actually develops in practice. And, and as um, Stephen uh, and Gina mentioned, um, and, and same in Hong Kong, we also have obviously bilateral agreements for sharing of, of certain types of information. In the US, as you know, confidential supervisor information you know, cannot be shared without express agreement and consent. So that causes you know, challenges. So the lawyers are often busy negotiating those types of agreements as, as you're aware. Um, so I think that concludes um, our session. We want to thank all of you for joining us for today's session. We hope this has been useful and we would welcome any feedback that you may have for our future sessions. And I'd like to thank my co-panelists as well. Thank you.